Landing SpaceX Starship HLS on the surface of the moon is going to be very challenging because of plume surface interactions. This is also true of Blue Moon and any other large human rated lander or even just large cargo lander that we wanna land on the surface of the moon. When we're talking about sending humans to Mars, or even just an uncrewed Starship to Mars, that is going to be challenging in its own way, in a different way, but perhaps even more challenging than landing on the moon because of the effect of how the gases from the engines interact with the surface of the planetary body. I'm gonna geek out on the physics in this video. I welcome you to join me. I'm Laura Forsick. I'm the executive director of space consulting firm Astrolytical, and I am a physicist by training. Last week, I had a client tell me that I am a nerd about Regulus, and guilty as charged, I am. And that had to do with a proposal review. Completely independent of that, last week, NASA hosted the Lunar Surface Science Workshop. All the presentations were recorded, so I will link to the playlist below if you want to check them out. I'm not going to go into all of the physics here. That would probably take an hour or two or ten. I am going to limit this discussion simply to large lunar landers. And I'll talk about Mars a little bit at the end. I don't believe I have any videos from the internship I did working with Phil Metzger at Kennedy Space Center one summer, but I will be stealing heavily from Phil Metzger's work as well as the team at UCF where I did my doctoral work. And as much as I am a nerd about this kind of physics, I am going to try to talk more practically about why this matters to NASA's Artemis program in particular. So first I wanted to find what is regolith. Regolith is a term we use to talk about the dirt, dust, little pebbles, even little rocks that are on the surface of a planetary body. Here on Earth, we have a specific type of regolith. We call it soil. There is life. There is microorganisms and macroorganisms in our dirt. Unless you are purposely sterilizing Earth dirt, it's going to have life in it. And as far as we know, none of the other regolith out there that we have access to, moon, Mars, asteroids, none of that has life. Dig farther down into Mars and maybe we'll find something. Lunar regolith in particular is quite harsh. It's not eroded in the same way that you'd expect Earth erosion to occur with wind and water flow. It is sharp and jagged. Mars a little bit less so because there is that erosion from wind and possibly from water. So when you're doing these kinds of experimental studies here on Earth, you have to keep in mind that the fundamental dirt that you're working with is so very different than what you'd experience, what you'd deal with on the lunar surface, on the Martian surface, on an asteroid surface, on any other planetary body. Another difference which makes a big difference is the vacuum of the surrounding environment on the moon. So the moon does not have an atmosphere. The moon has an exosphere. That's a teeny, teeny, teeny bit of particles that are around the moon, which really does really count. Because Earth has an atmosphere, because Mars has an atmosphere, it's, it's a lot thinner than Earth's atmosphere, but it does have an atmosphere, but the moon does not have an atmosphere. That means that when you're landing on the surface of the moon, you are landing essentially in a vacuum. And that makes a big difference to the physics. I'm going to talk about that. It might go without saying that gravity makes a big difference here. Of course, Earth's gravity is greater than Mars' gravity. Mars' gravity is greater than Earth Moon's gravity, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, the type of gases coming from your engines also makes a difference. And a lot of the stuff we just don't understand very well. But my understanding is that the permeability, the way that the gases flow through the regolith, differs depending on what type of gases you're using. Going back to the regolith, there are different types of regolith. There's different sizes. There's different, you know, the, the compositions are different. Whether or not there's ice changes the, the effects. The actual chemical makeup of the regolith, as far as I understand, doesn't make a huge difference. The presence of ice makes a big difference. Here's where I'm gonna get really nerdy. So we're gonna talk about erosion, specifically viscous erosion or surface erosion. When you have a retro rocket, say, landing on the surface of the moon, pushing hot gases down from the nozzle, what you're gonna see is the gases going into the regolith, into the ground, but also because you're in a vacuum of space, we talked about how the exosphere really doesn't do anything, you're in essentially a vacuum, which means the hot gases are actually gonna go down and out, and mostly out. So they're gonna spread radially along the surface of the moon, and they're gonna accelerate. Those gas molecules are gonna pick up whatever regolith or even small rocks they pass by. And what you're going to see is a sand blasting effect. What's really interesting is the way that we have been able to visually see this in imagery going back to the first lunar landers. We can see the way that the gases go outward and pick up things and leave traces. Even They even leave like um, lines, which has to do with the vortices of the way that the gas moves. And as it's going outward, it is sand blasting everything. <laughs> That's appropriate. It is sandblasting 
everything in a certain radius. We know that things get sandblasted because we witnessed this with Apollo. There have been studies done that not only would the sandblasting affect the surface surrounding the landing site, but it might even have enough energy to kick up regolith and put it in orbit around the moon, which would affect orbital infrastructure like Gateway, as well as any, you know, ascent or just descent, any, you know, landings or leavings of the surface of the moon. This might not be too much of a concern initially with initial landings, but future landings, when we are trying to build settlements, when we have Artemis Base Camp or several Artemis Base Camps, when we want to understand how we can have infrastructure somewhat near our landing site, then we need to understand what type of landing pad we need. Is it something super simple? There have been studies done where as a vehicle is landing, it can center the ground and create an instant landing site, an instant landing pad. Or does it need to be something more complex where you have dedicated you know, robotics perhaps that is building a landing pad ahead of your landing of your big vehicle? One thing we do know is that here on Earth, gases can get underneath your landing pad. If it's not built right, it can get under your landing pad and just kind of erupt your landing pad from underneath. Speaking of underneath, cratering is a major problem. And that's what I mainly studied was the cratering that is involved when you have gases pushing down onto a surface. Cratering happens pretty quickly, and it may or may not be a concern. It's not a concern with the smaller landers, but it will be probably a bit of a concern with the larger landers, especially since you're trying to land on a surface that might become unstable due to cratering from your engines. There's two types of cratering that I'm gonna talk about. There's the initial cratering, so the actual gas pushing down and creating something that's fairly narrow and deep, and then there's the residual crater from collapsing. That residual crater, it's usually shallower and it has to do with the angle of repose of the material. And so here's where the regolith does make a difference. If you don't know what angle of repose is, create a pile of a granular material like sand, for example, create a pile and see when that pile collapses. See how tall and narrow you can make it and when it starts to collapse. That collapse angle, that's your angle of repose. I, I've literally done this experiment. Your initial crater, the, the Narrow deep one is an issue, and then your residual crater, which is shallower and wider, is an issue as well. And here's where Mars becomes a little more complex because there is an atmosphere on Mars. I have not personally studied this, so my basic understanding is because Mars has an atmosphere, there's less of that gas, that hot gas from the landing plume going outward and more of it going downward. And so what you get is narrower, deeper, very, very deep craters underneath your Mars lander. You might be thinking, We've landed humans to the moon. We've landed vehicle-sized landers on the surface of, the, of Mars. Like, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is the larger you have your landers, the more this matters. And we just don't understand the physics. There's three things that we are currently doing and have been doing to better understand this. One is modeling. Taking you know fundamental physics and mathematics and trying to understand based on first principles how the physics works, how the different regimes work, you know, what happens when you change certain characteristics. I had to do a little bit of this, but I'm an absolutely terrible programmer, so I tried to do as little modeling as possible. But there are people who spend their entire careers doing this kind of modeling so that we can understand you know, what to expect when we go do something for real. And then there is the doing something for real, right? We've got the Earth analogs. We literally try to replicate the environments here on Earth. Lunar analogs, Martian analogs, we actually do the experiments here, pretending it is somewhere else. That, of course, is limited. The fidelity is fairly low. And then there's the doing things in real life, which I'm super excited to see that there are instruments on CLIPS landers, that's Commercial Lunar Payload Services. The CLIPS landers all have different instrumentation that usually is NASA provided or universities are involved. They're going to be measuring this in real time. They're going to be taking images in real time. As these landers are literally landing, they are going to be gathering data. And these are smaller landers, but there already are agreements in place, at least for Blue Moon Mark I, to have instrumentation on the larger landers as well. There is no substitute for real data in situ. I've been talking about human landers, large landers. I do want to do comparisons here. These numbers are the best that I could find. They might not be 100% correct. Blue Moon, that's Blue Origins Lunar Lander. Mark I, that's the uncrewed version. That has one BE-7 engine. So when you're talking about different plume effects, there's also interactions with the different engines, right? So one is the simplest and there's only one on Blue Moon Mark 1. So that should be really good data to start with. Blue Origin has said that they want to actually launch on their own dime a Blue Moon Mark 1 starting next year. 
That has a wet mass of 21,000 kilograms, roughly. Now, the Blue Moon Mark II, that one is the crewed lander, up to four people on board, I think. That one uses three BE-7 engines, so different plume effects going on there. Very interesting to see how that works out. It is a larger lander. Dry mass of 16,000 kilograms, launch mass of greater than 45 kilograms. I don't think they know the exact specs at this point. And going into estimations here, Starship Human Landing System, HLS. That has six Raptor engines. And as far as I can tell, a mass of five tons. That's huge. And I don't know if that's wet mass, dry mass. Like That's just a huge, huge vehicle, right? So when we're talking about getting this data so that we can prepare ahead of time to do this safely, to do human landings on the moon safely, to do human landings on Mars safely, then we need to understand the physics for the smaller landers, quote unquote smaller landers, before we can understand what's going to happen with these gigantic landers, with Starship in particular. This makes a big difference when you're talking about a future where multiple starships are planned to land in the same general vicinity, and even multiple starships landing and staying there to create an infrastructure for a lunar base or a Martian base. So understanding how we do safe landings of starship and blue moon, and understanding how the sand blasting works, how the cratering works, what landing pads are needed. And then we get into geopolitics when it comes to the Outer Space Treaty and the Artemis Accords talking about safety zones. We usually talk about that in terms of mining, but we also need to talk about it in terms of landing, especially on the moon, where there might be that danger of sandblasting at great distances. The two earlier Eclipse missions this year from Astrobotic and Intuitive Machines unfortunately did not get us the data that we needed. So I'm really hopeful that the future Intuitive Machines mission, I am too, as well as the Firefly Blue Ghost mission, which is currently still scheduled for the end of this year, I'm hoping that that starts to give us more data about how the these engines and the surface of the moon really interact, and that'll help prepare us for Artemis 3, the first human landing with Starship. Thank you for geeking out with me.